Okay, welcome back to the channel. I wanted to jump on very quickly today and go over this video I saw from Dr. Mike Isratel yesterday, I believe it was. For anyone who doesn't know, Dr. Mike is a doctor of exercise science based out of the East Coast. He has a channel with about three and a half million subscribers, and I love a lot of his stuff. It's heavily science-based. I know for all you bro lifters out there, take that with a grain of salt, but it's a lot of great stuff, and he's a very funny guy. But the subject of his video yesterday was, quote, the end of steroids, how new muscle drugs are here and what he's going to go over in this video. This video was originally 26 minutes long. I think I can get this down a little bit to something a little quicker and digestible and add my occasional little bit of value here and there. But what he's going to go over in this video are a couple of new drugs that if they do come out as planned, they're in trials right now as planned in, let's say, 2027 or so would completely obliterate the need for steroids. These two drugs would not only completely obliterate the need for steroids, but could single-handedly solve obesity as well. So some pretty crazy stuff. I mean, we're talking drugs that have little to no side effects and instead just grant you couch bound muscle growth. <laughs> Zero lifting required muscle growth. Obviously, if you lift, the benefits will be even more pronounced, but it's pretty crazy stuff. And I just wanted to cover it here very quickly. Okay. So let's dive right into it with Dr. Mike. Folks, for a few years now, if you've been tuned into this channel, if not, no big deal. Welcome. I've been yapping uncontrollably about the theoretical potential benefits of what are called non-androgenic anabolics, drugs that increase your skeletal muscle mass, which we all deeply desire, but at the same time have limited or no androgenic side effects. What are androgenic side effects? So basically, if you could grow muscle without suffering any of the side effects of, let's say, steroids, which, you know, are there because what they're doing is increasing your masculinity, whether you like it or not. If you're a female, you definitely don't like it. And you can see the long list of side effects that they, by increasing your masculinity, you bring on these side effects. These would be things like hair loss, acne, increased body hair, bad lipid profiles, liver strain, aggression, anxiety, prostate enlargement, testicular atrophy, that kind of stuff. So if you could have muscle growth without any of these side effects, obviously we would all choose to have it, uh, especially women who get a lot of really shitty side effects if they decide to take anabolics um, that they absolutely don't want in addition to growing muscle. Of course, facial hair growth, which females tend to find displeasing in most cases. So the question is, why do steroids cause these? And the answer is steroids are not a muscle growth drug. They are a drug that is just designed to masculinize animals, like all mammals and humans. And yeah, sorry, I jumped the gun. It's exactly what I just said. Steroids just increase masculinity, basically. So if you get a drug that gave you muscle without necessarily increasing masculinity, or maybe you did a testosterone for a bit of those masculinization effects that as a man, we probably want. And then you did, you know, these type of drugs on top of that, which we'll get into what these types of drugs are in a second, then yeah, obviously huge benefits for people that don't want the side effects, but want all the gains. So he's going to break down the study that we're talking about here today. And because the brilliant mind at the Regeneron Pharmaceuticals Corporation have just such a drug and they have published research about it. I want to tell you all about this drug until I'm just salivating about it. In fact, it's not just like it's a combo drug therapy. It's two, two drugs at the same time. Travagramab, good luck saying that one, and Goretismab, good luck saying that one also. Who the f makes these? So yeah, these are the two drug names. One's a myosatin antagonist and one's an active NA antagonist. And I'll let him break down exactly what those do. Both drugs work by reducing the activity of myostatin and activin A. Myostatin and activin A, their predominant roles in skeletal muscle are to cap, to hold down, to reduce how much muscle you grow at any given time. And when these drugs uncork those caps, reduce the activity of myostatin and activin A, you get this radical unleashing of completely natural, in a sense, muscle growth that your body wants to do all the time, but it has these two substances it makes itself, these two proteins, myostatin and activin A, capping this muscle growth all the time. What these drugs do is they just go and uncork them. A myostatin deficiency probably best seen in something like this bowl here. So you can see just absolutely shredded, very lean, huge disproportionate amount of muscle growth. That's just like completely uncapped. A suppression of myostatin is what you're seeing there. 
Now he's going to break down the design of the study that Regeneron has done. This was a study over 20 weeks and it used monkeys. So all the weights are in grams because monkeys are small. I'll let him describe. We have four groups of monkeys getting four different treatments. One group of monkeys had to diet. They restricted their calories a little bit. And they dieted natty. These are natty monkeys, right? They're monkeys that go on forums and talk about everyone's a drug addict. They accuse everyone of taking drugs. Coke. Then there are monkeys that received semaglutide, a.k.a. Ozempic, which is a drug that is a modern drug, mostly works by reducing your appetite. Another group of monkeys three, received only the myostatin blocker drug. Okay? And then group four received the myostatin blocker drug and the activin A blocker drug, that real dual therapy, that tip of the spear. That's what we're testing there. The first two groups, the group that is natty and the group that is taking Ozempic, you know, the natty group lost 400 grams of body fat in 20 weeks and 15 grams of muscle loss or lean mass loss. And the monkeys taking semaglutide or Ozempic lost 700 grams of body fat, um, but lost about 100 grams of muscle with it. Actually still not a bad ratio, but you can see like that increased muscle loss that comes with the acute caloric deficit induced by something like semaglutide. There's nothing inherently catabolic about semaglutide as far as we know, but that precipitous caloric deficit that these drugs usually does result in a little bit more muscle loss than you would see if you were to diet natty. I just went through, well, I'm still going through several months now of retitrutide, and I definitely experienced additional muscle loss as opposed to the last time I dieted natty or cut natty, which was late summer, last summer, basically. So yeah, it's unsurprising, these first two groups. It's just, it's not a semaglutide thing. It's not that the molecule is making you lose fat. Or sorry, it's not like the molecule is making you lose muscle in some special way. It's just driving a crazy deficit and then you lose more muscle. So those monkeys that were on semaglutide, they, do, they did lose 700 grams versus 400 grams of fat. Amazing. Almost 2X. But they lost close to about 100 grams of muscle with it. Still, hey, 7 to 1 ratio is really good. Yeah, but like, man, they ratio. lost maybe like 5 or 6 times more muscle than the monkeys that just did the shit natty. So, okay, yeah. all right, trade-offs. And it's like a known trade-off, no big deal. Here's the thing. The monkeys that were given semaglutide and trivagramab, which is myostatin block, lost about 1,300 grams of body fat. Okay, real quick. Natty monkeys, 400 gram loss of fat. Semaglutide monkeys, 700 gram loss of fat. <laughs> I can't, I had to laugh when I say this. The triple, the, the, the monkeys that got semaglutide and the myostatin blocker, trivagramab, lost 1,300 grams of fat. That is almost double the semaglutide group and more than three times the drug-free group. And those monkeys lost about 15 grams of muscle. So what you're seeing there is obviously the muscle, not just sparing, but potentially muscle growth aspect of the trivagramab coming into play. Obviously, there's something in it that's accelerating the loss of fat as well. So you're you know almost doubling the loss of fat from the previous group, the semaglutide-only group. And then you're dramatically reducing by a factor of what, six, six and a bit, uh, the loss of muscle mass, which is huge. It's obviously now you're basically dieting on an extreme cut with no loss whatsoever. And as he says in this video, that alone would be a massive finding. But I'm going to let him just break down the fourth group. <laughs> Monkeys that took the combo therapy, they took semaglutide, they took trivagramab. And they took goretismab, and goretismab is the active and A inhibitor. So now we got mastan inhibitor in the works and active and A. Those monkeys lost 1,400-ish grams of fat, Even a little bit more, more fat. notably more than the monkeys that were just on the mastan inhibitor, then group three, but not a ton more. But check this out. Those monkeys didn't lose 15 grams of fat. Sorry, good God. Those monkeys didn't lose 15 grams of muscle like the drug-free monkeys did or like the myostatin monkeys did. They didn't lose 100 grams of muscle like the semaglutide monkeys did. They gained on a deficit, by the way. Monkeys don't resistance train, by the way. They gained 450 or so grams of muscle during the course of this diet, which was 20 weeks long, by the way. So we're going from dieting drug-free, you lose a little bit of muscle, almost not at all, but you don't lose a whole lot of fat. To dieting with semaglutide, we use a lot more fat, but a substantial amount of muscle, nothing crazy, but that's annoying. To adding in the myostatin inhibitor, trivagramab, and all of a sudden you are going to lose almost no muscle, just a little bit of muscle loss, but you are losing almost double the amount of fat that you did with the semaglutide and close to just actually over three times the amount of fat that you did drug-free. 
And in the combo therapy, the triple therapy, semaglutide, trivagramab, and gretismab, we got the GLP-1, we've got the myostatin inhibitor, and we have got the active and A inhibitor, all combined into one, into one vehicle, into one drug, you're losing even more fat than you did with just myostatin by a little bit. You're now losing about double the fat that you did with semaglutide alone and close to four times the amount of fat you lost drug free. What? But you are gaining the amount of muscle that is roughly equivalent to the amount of fat that you lost drug free. This is insane. This is insane. Let's talk about some insights of this because this is totally wild stuff. This is totally wild stuff. It goes against everything we know about cutting. You cannot gain muscle while you are cutting. You have to be in a caloric surplus to put on muscle, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, if you're not natty, you can gain muscle a little bit when you're cutting, but it's hard. And it's just, it's absolutely insane to see something here where you've got such an aggressive cut, such an aggressive deficit coupled with not only the maintenance of muscle mass, but the frankly, extreme accrual of muscle mass is bonkers, completely revolutionary. And he's going to break down what it means in the human context. And because these are primates, there's a strong level of correlation between these sort of primate results and humans. So we'll get the human breakdown in a second. Before we get into that, he's going to break down very quickly what this means for steroids. The combo therapy, that triple, triple threat of semaglutide, trivagramab, and gratismab, on fat loss and muscle gain are what we would expect with semaglutide plus a really solid dose of mega steroids for someone who's never taken steroids before, except with zero androgenic side effects, no hair growth, no voice deepening, no aggression, no bad lipid profiles, none of that stuff. How big of a deal? It's a huge deal. Absolutely huge deal. Okay, he's going to break this down, what this means in a human context now, and so I'll let him go with that. So imagine you have an identical twin and you're both a decent bit out of shape. Let's say you're about 200 pounds both, and you're both at about 20% body fat. Your twin is a natty for life. There's a number four in there somewhere. 200 pounds, 20% body fat. I was there a few months ago, maybe not quite 20%. So this is pretty applicable. What he's talking about here is like a theoretical twin study where, you know, so genetically they're both pretty much identical. And if you had both of you starting at 200 pounds and 20% body fat, and one of them is going to diet natty and the other is going to diet with the, uh, the combination. He's going to diet for five months straight, reasonably, drug-free, and extrapolating this primate data, he would lose as a group one monkey. He would, <laughs> you come up to your twin, you're like, you're a group one monkey. He's like, shut up. <laughs> anyway, he would lose about eight pounds of fat and lose less than a pound of muscle. So there you go. Five months, you lost eight pounds of fat, less than a pound of muscle. You wind up at about 16.5% body fat. And this, the second twin takes all three drugs, the semaglutide and the two new drugs by Regeneron. And we we're going to see what that extrapolates to for this person that starts at 200 pounds and 20% body fat over five months. At the end of that five-month diet, extrapolating from this primate data, you would lose about 28 pounds of fat while gaining nine pounds of muscle. That means while your twin was about 192 pounds at the end of the diet, you would be about 181 and your twin is around 16.5% fat at the end of the diet, you would be around 6.5% body fat. Scott, make this make sense. It doesn't make sense. That person would be absolutely shredded and they would go to work and people would just be blown away at what they look like. It would just not even be close, the difference between those two people visually. And so he's going to wrap up what this means in a second. And so I'll cut back to him for that. Here's the thing, another implication. Folks who currently use steroids and suffer through all their side effects, which I've been through uh, for a large fraction of my life, will really have to ask themselves a question of why the hell are we using steroids at all? I think almost everyone who's currently using steroids will just switch to TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, or just go drug free and just to feel good and perform well. And then the muscle growth part is just going to be handled by these drugs, which do it much more directly and way, way better. Yeah, exactly. So he's saying like TRT to TRT plus ranges. TRT is, let's call it like 100 to 180, 175 milligrams a week of test. TRT plus is, I don't know, use your imagination beyond that. Uh, but probably not like, you know, the the gram plus a week that like a bodybuilder would take. So, you know, just staying to sort of safe kind of bioidentical TRT ranges for testosterone supplementation and achieving all the muscle growth through drugs like these that have zero androgenic side effects. 
That's a whole new world that just blows away the need for steroids altogether. And another good point, females will stop taking steroids altogether. We'll see a renaissance of female physique sport, the likes of which we've never seen. You'll see way more muscular females, but without any of the pimples or the hair loss or the hair growth on a whole range of shit women just don't want. It's going to be kind of trippy, actually, to see what women's bodybuilding looks like when these kind of drugs take over, because we are so used to seeing on those IFBB stages when it comes to women, what like a hyper masculinized woman looks like, because that is the only way to put on that type of muscle mass as a woman. But if you can just put on muscle mass and remain feminine, it's hard to even imagine what that looks like right now. I think you'd have to go to AI to be able to draft what that looks like. I'm going to let him cover the remainder of these, and then I'll chime in and then we'll be done. Regular folks who aren't even in the gym because they have such crap genetics or just, just have not been able to get, just get their claws into the fitness industry, um, they'll be able to hit the gym and sculpt their bodies to their desire. Will some folks just take these drugs and not go to the gym? Absolutely. God bless them. Whatever. We don't need them in the gym crowding up the shit, but at least now they're in way better health, way more muscle, way less fat. Our medical system saves billions of dollars and people are healthier and happier and look better. This is a big deal. And my prediction on gyms specifically is that we might see a decline in overall general gym attendance or maybe about the same, but we're going to see a second renaissance. The first one was in the, in the 70s and 80s, really in the 80s, if you think about it, of hardcore gym attendance. Because hardcore folks like most of you watching, many of you watching, if you're given a drug that radically increases muscle growth, that doesn't mean you stop going to the gym. That means you go to the gym more because you're more empowered to make a more perfect version of yourself. Scott, can you imagine? This is the thing. If you see a connection between what you're doing in the gym and results, that's what hooks you. I think what's hard for a lot of people is if you go to the gym and you don't see a connection between your activity in the gym and the results on your body. You don't see yourself getting leaner or you don't see yourself growing muscle. That's, you know... That's the difference between someone that goes for a few weeks or a few months and quits and someone that sticks with it for a lifetime. And if you're talking about drugs like this that have like very, very safe risk profiles, potentially, obviously we got to wait until they, they come out, but safe risk profiles and don't confer all those undesirable side effects and instead just sort of uncap the limit on your muscle growth, I think you're going to see people make that connection a lot more readily. And like he says, you could have some people that don't go to the gym at all and still get these benefits, but you will have people that probably more people, in my opinion, that could wind up going to the gym because you really do see the connection. And I think what you'll also see is actually an inflation, like an aesthetic inflation, one that we've sort of already arguably had, like we've had an aesthetic inflation. If you look at just what kind of at least from a male perspective, you look at like, geez, Daniel Craig, Casino Royale coming out of the water. I covered this in one of my other videos, but like that was like, wow, look at that male physique to what we look at today as like an idealized male physique is just, it's hyperinflated. There's a lot more mass involved. I imagine we will see something similar. So regular Joes are walking around shredded with solid musculature, great cap delts and that sort of stuff. <laughs> you know, what it, what then length will you have to go to in the gym to stand out from that if you want to stand out from that? Again, there's a debate on whether or not women even care about muscles. I think they do. I hope they do. <laughs> but like, you know, that is going to be an interesting thing to keep an eye on. So Anyways, I really just wanted to come on here and share Mike's video. You should check out his channel if you don't already watch it. It is a lot of great stuff, but this was this got me particularly excited. I forwarded it to a friend of mine and said, buy Regeneron stock. <laughs> this is not stock advice. I am not being paid by Regeneron. But I just thought this was fascinating because um, there hasn't been, an, obviously, any innovation in the steroids uh, for a lot of years because they are all but outlawed everywhere. Even drugs like Primaballin, which used to be made by a bear, I don't think that's made anymore because it's just not sold anymore. The advancements in steroids frozen in time from a couple decades ago because they were banned. And now you're, you were looking at alternate pathways to come at the muscle building problem pharmaceutically. And this is absolutely incredible, a myostatin inhibitor. It, for those of us that have dreamed of having a myostatin deficiency, uh, just genetically, just naturally, hey, maybe there's a way for us uh, to realize our dreams. <laughs> Anyways, thanks again for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Please comment below. I love the engagement. It obviously helps the channel and I love chatting with people, even the comments that aren't so nice. <laughs> I appreciate the, the time taken to, to leave them. So thanks again and have a good one.